John's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning in verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leading back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered, entered the him. Then Jesus said to him, what, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so humbled to be able to sit at your feet and to learn from you and your word. We know that you say that your words will outlive the heavens and the earth. Lord, so what a privilege it is to be able to have you build our lives upon your word. We know, Lord, that you said in the parable of the, of the, the soils that if we don't understand that the seed is the word of God and that we don't understand how it, when it's planted in the proper soil, if we don't understand that parable, we can't understand any of the parables. So we want to have hearts that are ready to have your word germinate and to produce fruit a hundredfold. Lord, I pray that you would bear fruit through us uh, that, are, that call this place our home, Lord. And we want to bless you by having you bear fruit through our lives and you be glorified. So we commit it to you. We ask that you set this time aside for your holy use. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I apologize for the lack of heat. It's gotten better since so many of us have come into the room, but it's, it's not working. The landlord knows about this. Hopefully it'll be being looked at this week. So just bundle up, rub your hands together, uh, do whatever you need to do to stay warm. Um, it could be a lot worse. We could be in the Central Valley right now where it gets a lot colder than here. So um, let's be thankful. Uh, or, the, you know, who knows, place like the North Pole just random places that we'd never go. We, it could be that cold here if for some weird reason. So anyway, super thankful for, for the heat. <laughs> it makes you be thankful for it when you don't have it. Uh, so we are in the middle of this scene in uh, the upper room. This is a place that um, Jesus is really going to focus on from this point on. We're going to see him really minister to his disciples. He's preparing them for his departure. So they finish eating. And they have been arguing over who's the greatest, which is really sad. Here Jesus is focused on them, trying to prevent them from being stumbled by uh, Judas. And he's, and he's also focused on them and preparing them for his departure. But yet they're focused on themselves. And they're self-consumed, which is really silly sad because I know it would bless him if they were you know, not doing that, and they were focused on the right things and everything, but he knows when he gets us, he gets a project. How many of you know that about how when God got you, he got a project? Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. He got a big project uh, with me, um, and he's still working on me. So, But all these things were, um, you know, happening all at once. They're in the room. I love the fact that that John is so loving to us that he lets us be in on what happens in a room. You ever wish that you were, we always say the, the phrase, you know, if walls could talk, you know, wish I could be a fly on the wall. I don't know why it's a fly. It could be anything, you know, but we just prefer flies, I guess, on walls. But, um, you know, but you could say a grasshopper, you can say whatever might be on the wall. Um, you know, all right. If I were a termite in the wall and had great hearing, then I could hear, I, could, I just wish I could be in the room. Well, we get to be in the room. So in the context of them fighting about who's the greatest, to their shock, Jesus gets up and he sheds his outer garment. He, he takes this bowl of water, he kneels down, and he washes the disciples' feet one by one, one by one. What was that like? John remembers everything. He remembers how everything was, how everything felt. And then Jesus sat down and he, got, he, he started saying some things. And I want us for context, look back at verse 15, and I want to read up to where we're at today, just for some context, especially if you weren't here. In verse 15, we're told, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, 
A servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. For if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the same about anything in the Christian life that he tells us to do. Now, the true blessing comes in the obedience. The true blessing comes in the obeying. That's how he's blessed. It's so easy for us to forget how we can bless him by obeying him. And, we're, and obedience is better than sacrifice, we're told in Scripture. So he wants our obedience. Jesus said, why do you say you love me if you don't obey the things that I say? You can't, those two things are incongruent. You love and, and, and you disobey. If you love, you obey. So uh, he says, blessed are you, not just if you know them, but if you do them. Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. We saw that that references, and you can write in your margin uh, in Psalm 41.9, that, that David was speaking, didn't even know he was prophesying uh, about the future. And he had, he had uh, his trusted confidant, Ahithophel, turn on him and, and, and go with his son Absalom in, the, in, in Absalom's attempt to take David out and become king. And we talked about how uh, that happened primarily because of bitterness in Ahithophel's heart, because his granddaughter was none other than Bathsheba. So David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered Ahithophel's son-in-law, Bathsheba's husband, to try to cover it up. And from that point on, you see him go towards him. And so I talked about his uh, hospitality. It was like when you break bread with somebody, you're safe. You know, like they can't do anything to you at that moment. It's such a sacred thing to show hospitality. So that's the backdrop of that. And then we're going to get into Jesus giving, you know, this bread to... Um, to Judas, which will complete that prophecy. Verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So he was troubled in his spirit. It bothered him. It bothered him. It was agitated. His, his soul was agitated that, that Judas was going to do this. And, and that what the effect would be on the other disciples, the other 11, because of this Happening, so he's so we started to see Judas Judas being purged, and that's um, what we start started last week. I want to do part two. So my, the message is entitled this morning: "The Betrayer Is Purged." Part two. So in today's passage, um, from twenty two on, we're going to see till till the end of the, our verses today. We're going to see five main things. We're going to see the disciples not knowing who Jesus is talking about; they're absolutely clueless. Jesus is going to give bread to Judas, thus completely fulfilling that prophecy in, Matthew, in uh, the, the Psalm 41. And then we're going to see Satan possess Judas, which is no small thing, of course. And then Jesus tells him to go and why he told them or how he told them to go, we'll look at. And then also that the disciples don't understand why Judas left. They're, they're still clueless. Now, before we begin, we need to know something about the disciples and what's happened before this, even before the things that John describes in his account. And what we learn from Matthew's gospel in, in uh, Matthew 26, verses 21 through 25, is that they'd already heard this whole thing about the betrayer. In, in verse 21 and following of Matthew 26, we're told this, Now as they were eating, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, this means that Judas was sitting near, near Jesus. They had various little bowls and little cups that they would dip things in. And the fact that Judas was that close where they could share that same um, you know, cup to dip in, uh, that would show how close Judas was. So we don't know why, how Jesus ordered them, if they even did. Uh, we know that, Judah, that, that John was, was the closest to him, uh, and we'll see that in a moment. But So here it reveals that, they, that all this has happened. So we see in verse 24, the Son of Man, in Matthew 26, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who is betraying him, notice the word, it's, it's present tense in this, in this thing, in this verse, betraying him. 
Because he's in the process of betraying him. He'd, he'd already done a lot regarding that. And, and uh, answered and said, so Judas is speaking in this, in this here on the, on, the, on the screen here. Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. That's what Jesus said. So they were asking uh, if it was them. And they also um, you know, heard Jesus say, whoever dips at the same time in, in the cup uh, with me is, is the man. I don't know how much they really understood that or thought about that. Um, and also we see Judas say, is it I? And Judas said, yes, it is, it is you, which, which tells us again he was close because he could say it to him without everyone else hearing. So all of this has already happened before our, 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 our uh, verses here. It was during dinner. So that means it happened before because we're told at the beginning of John chapter 13 that dinner had already ended by the time he washed their feet. So they're hearing it multiple times and they're questioning, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And, and uh, so we, we see that, you know, this is something that John reveals and he's adding to the overall uh, account of all four gospels in what was happening at the Last Supper in this upper room. So on all of this, they still didn't know that it was Judas. Even and, and, and after they, you know, all this happened with Judas and the one that dips the same time as I do, all of that, they still didn't know. Which brings me to my first point, which is our flesh is capable of anything. Look at me at verse 22 in our main text. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. They first were arguing about, again, who's the greatest. And, and so we don't really see it in our text that this has already happened. But what we see from the other gospel, as we've already read in Matthew 26, is that they were exceedingly sorrowful. You don't get that in John's gospel, that they were exceedingly sorrowful. And then they asked a very, I believe, a very healthy question, is it I? So why were they sorrowful? Why, why were they so sad? You know, because it doesn't just say they were sorrowful. It says they were exceedingly sorrowful. And why? Why were they sorrowful? I believe, and we can't know for sure, but I believe that it's in part because they, they knew that it could be them. They knew it's possible that it could be them. They also could have been sorrowful that, that even though they knew it wasn't, I mean, they all said, is it I? But the point is, is that they, it was just a bad situation that, that, that Jesus have to be that de- dealing with. He had to deal with someone that's going to betray them, and then that brings him sorrow. And then the fact that it could be them. So that's the key. They didn't put it past themselves, which I believe is healthy. Because they don't, we don't even know our own hearts. How many times have you heard people say, Christians say, I could never do that sin. I could never do blank. That sin, I could never do that. That is very unhealthy. I don't think it's biblical to say, I could never do such and such. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth about learning from Old Testament examples in Scripture. And he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 8 through 12, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Verse 10, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And the next verse is key. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands, and you could put put in brackets there, he thinks he stands in his own strength, take heed lest he fall. Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to a church. He's writing to believers that have the Holy Spirit in them. Now, they were a carnal church. The Church of Corinth is one of the most carnal churches and sinful churches that Paul wrote epistles to. Now, we sometimes say, I wish we could be like the early church. Well, which which version? The ones that turned the world upside down and spread the gospel or the ones that were needed great uh, discipleship and instruction and all of that, most of the epistles were written as corrective epistles. So none of us, including myself, given the right circumstances, are immune to doing anything. 
the right circumstances, and you should say another way of saying it is the wrong circumstances, like the worst situation, apart from the Lord, we are capable of doing any sin that you can think of. And to say that that's not true is not fully understanding your flesh, not fully understanding how Satan can set us up. And we could be in the worst situation and, and be in a weak moment. And when then we could forget for the ask to be refilled with the Spirit and, and submit ourselves to God so that the, the, the devil will flee from us. And as we resist him, all that could happen. So we have to recognize that all of us are, are capable in our flesh to do anything. And that's why it's so important for us to submit ourselves to God, like Peter tells us. And to have those devotions every single day. And to have, Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So God calls us to feed our spirits. Sometimes we try so hard to have spiritual success with earthly or fleshly tactics as Christians. We just roll up our sleeves, just try harder, willpower. You know, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Instead of it's so much easier, and Jesus is going to talk about it a couple chapters from now in chapter 15. All we have to do is abide in him. That's the key. We don't focus on trying to be holy. We focus on drawing close to Jesus. And as an overflow, as a a supernatural overflow of that, then he bears fruit through our lives. And that's why Jesus said among those same verses, in that same context, in verse 5 of chapter 15, for apart from me, you can do nothing. He's speaking that into the context of people arguing about who's the greatest. Just must have just, just smiting their pride or whatever the past tense word is, a smite. You know, just, just to hit them so hard. You can't, you bring nothing to the table. There is no, it's not, you, you know, God is my co-pilot. Like he's the whole plane. He's the runway. He's the, he's the, he's the, the, the tower. He's the, the FS, FC, FAA or whatever organization that governs everything. He's like the whole entire thing. Don't, not Jesus take the wheel. Jesus, you start with the wheel. You know, t- you start with control. You start with me le- yielding to you every single day. The Lordship issue has to be settled every single day day, the lordship issue. I have to settle that. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me every single day. That's not popular in our culture. It just isn't. Not popular in, in churches. And the, and the leaders, whether, whether knowingly or unknowingly, they know that if they just give messages that people want to hear, and what are the messages that people want to hear? Carnal believers or unbelievers, what do they want to hear? They want to hear how to have success. They want to hear how how to have prosperity. They want to hear about how can I make everything in my life how I want it. But Jesus said, and it's not a popular message, but we will always teach this message because we will always teach what's in here. And what's in here is we have no life apart from him. We are dead. Jesus didn't come to make good people better and improve on their lives and add a little Jesus to my routine. And somehow that will, okay, you know, I got my weight plan. I got my, you know, my emotional YouTubes that I'm watching to get better emotionally. I'm working on all these things. And then I need to work, give a little time for spiritual health. So I'm going to just going to give a few minutes to a sermonette, as I call them. Uh, and and just just have everything be man centered. The problem is this is not man centered. This is God centered. You can't make this man centered. It's God centered. And 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 also beginning our focus on others. The key to Christian growth is loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. That's true even in church. So as we so it's an indirect thing that happens. It's not a, we're not focusing on. We're focusing on loving God worshiping God, growing as disciples. Going through verse by verse is people just, they don't really, a lot of people don't want that. I see people come in and and it's not just because I'm not funny. I recognize that that's true. And they're dying. They're not just dying from my bad jokes. They just don't want to be confronted by scripture. They want a nice little tidy message that adds to what they want to, what they want to add to their life, but they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be changed. They don't want to be confronted by God's word. They don't want to be convicted and they're uncomfortable and they start fidgeting, you know, and they're like, where do I, there's nowhere to hide. The Holy Spirit's honoring his word and just like putting them on sanctified blast. 
and they're just convicted. There's nowhere to hide because the Holy Spirit's so good at, at backing up and saying yes and amen to, to the Scriptures. So that's why people don't last in churches that are serious about the Word, a lot of them. But the people that are hungry, the people that are wanting to grow and be a disciple, they don't care about that. Most of you do not care about the fact that God's going to deal with you and convict you. And he tells pastors, he told Timothy, who is timid, timid Timothy, you know, isn't, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And he told him, he told him do not any, let anyone despise your youth. That being 30-something years old, probably. That was considered youth back then. The older I get, the more I consider that youth. <laughs> but, you know, he's telling him, he says to him, all these things, and I think of these things because it's called me to be a shepherd as much as he called Timothy to be a pastor over Ephesus at that time. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and patience. For a time will come when men do not want sound doctrine, but they will heap up for themselves. Again, heap up for themselves. They're the catalyst. They, they are the ones that, that, that choose these people and put these people before them and let them influence them. Heap up for themselves teachers who will give them what their itching ears want to hear. The flesh wants to hear prosperity and success. The flesh doesn't want to hear diet. You're dead. The flesh doesn't want to hear you're dead. It just does not want to hear that. So we have to understand that there is no... This, this healthy response is them yielding to God and saying, you know the future. You know, they, they, they had no plans. Eleven of them didn't have any plans. There was no plans in their heart. That's why we saw in that other passage, it's, he, was, he was already betraying him. He'd already gone to the chief priests. He'd already got the 30 pieces of silver. He'd already, we're told in another place, was looking for opportunities. Now, John gives us some details about himself and Peter that we, that we only see in this account. Look at me in verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now John is referencing himself this way, the one who Jesus loved. It's the first of six times he's going to refer to himself in this way. And I want to just clarify this because I've heard some confusion about this, and I was confused about this at one point. Here's what John is not saying. He's not saying he's the only one that Jesus loved. And he's not saying that God, Jesus loved him more than he loved the other apostles. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is he's expressing how much it meant to him that Jesus loved him. It, it, it touched him so deeply that Jesus loved him. He wanted to, he wanted, he had no idea, he had no problem, I should say, with people knowing that he, it mattered so much to him that Jesus loved him. Because it can't mean that he loved John more because God loves equally everybody as much as they can be loved. And he doesn't show partiality, we're told, in Scripture. So that would mean that Scripture would contradict Scripture, which we know it doesn't. So John is, is saying this. So he's, he's saying the one who Jesus loved, he could, if he, he could have worded this way, the one who it meant so much to him that Jesus loved. Because that's, that's the whole idea behind it. And I'm sure that, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what the disciple, the other disciples thought when they read this for the first time. You know, I, I think by this time, this is decades later, many of them are gone by now uh, at this point. Most of them are gone by now. But, but he was just so secure. And so they, you know, he wanted to, to say it. So now we're told, John tells us he was leaning on Jesus' bosom, leaning back and resting his head on Jesus' chest. If you're not familiar with the Bible and you're familiar with the Last Supper painting, <laughs> you'll think that they were sitting in chairs at this, at this Last Supper up there in the supper room, but they weren't. They reclined back then. That's why it's weird. How could John put his head back on Jesus' chest if they're in chairs? That's really strange. But they were reclining, and John did that. And so we're told in verse 24, Simon Peter therefore motioned to ask to him who it was of whom he spoke. Peter motioned to ask him. What did that look like? How did, how did he do that? You ever notice, I'm going to walk over here for a second because I'm trying to get used to walking around. It's weird for me. But have you ever noticed in school that girls could talk to each other with no voice? How many of you women did that as a girl? You talk, oh, there's one, there's two, there's three, four. I see that hand. I know you did it, Janine. There's, I mean, and it's so frustrating because 
you know, I'm trying to understand what they're saying and they don't want me to understand. So they're mouthing it, making, you know, Millie Vanilli proud, uh, just doing such a good job of lip syncing. And, I, and I'm trying to figure out what are you saying? What are you, what are you saying? I can't understand it, but they know exactly. It was so frustrating. You can tell it still bothers me. But, but that, that, that's, that's what he was doing. How did, how did Peter motion to him? Did he say like, like do it, doc, you know, or rest your head on his, on his chest and ask him, you know, I don't know how he did it, but he motioned to him somehow. This is going on between Peter and John. No one else knew what was, what was happening. He's like, ask him, ask him, who is it? They wanted to know so bad. So we don't know how, how he did it, but it cracks me up that he motioned. Peter's like a take action kind of guy. He's like, I'm going to make this happen. I, w- I want to know for sure uh, who's, the, who's the person here. Of course, he didn't think it was him probably. Um, but they had no plans. To, none of the rest of them knew, had plans for doing that. But they, they, you know, he, they know that Jesus knows the future. So they trust him. So we're told in verse 25 that John actually did it. Then leaning back on Jesus' breath, breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And it was just between them. Again, now, I believe that John did this so quickly because, you know, he probably wanted to know, of course, too, but, but he's quite a bit younger. Remember, he's in his teens at this point, very, very young. So he's going to listen to Peter, so he does it, and he leans back and says, who is it? And now his answer is just going to be between him and John. So he's not going to announce to the whole group this whole thing, but it's between them. No one hears it, and we know that because if they would have heard it and understood it, they all wouldn't be confused that we see at the end of our text this morning about why did Judas leave? They, they would know what Jesus said, what he said to him was because he's the one that was going to betray. But they were clueless. And there's lessons regarding that, which we'll see. Verse 26, now Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So Jesus had already dipped in the bowl with Judas, already done that. They didn't catch on to that. They asked, who is it? Who is it? Is it I? Is it I? But again, this is fulfilling Psalm 41, 9, um, which clearly says that I shared bread with. He raised his heel up against me. So this, again, God's in control of this whole scene. Nothing's out of control. And so he, he, you know, that Psalm says, he eats bread with me. And so we're told in verse 27, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered in. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. So, so God didn't allow him to be possessed by Satan until this scripture was fulfilled. They'd already dipped in the same bowl, but that wasn't fulfilling scripture. Sharing bread, like the fellowship, because he likely ate the bread. And they're, they're joined together mystically in their belief system. And so there's that closeness that he'd be willing to betray him after sh- being shown hospitality. So then we're told that happens. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him, and Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. So um, again, Satan or Judas was not a victim. Judas had already done all this. He was in the, co- the process of betraying him, and he already has, you know, made this arrangement with the chief priests. They were the chief priests, we're told, in other places. Chief priests, and we were told that he got the 30 pieces of silver and was waiting for this opportunity. So all this has happened. And so he didn't know. So Judas ahead of time didn't know where this upper room Passover meal and everything would, would, would happen. You might remember from Luke 22, verses 7 through 12, this, that then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? See, they didn't know. They didn't know where it was. That means that Judas didn't know. And and so then we're told in verse 10 in that passage, and he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will be carry, meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room. There make it ready. 
So Jesus could have said, this guy had a name, of course. Jesus could have said in front of all the disciples, go to so-and-so's house. Go to, um, you know, Benjamin Stein, you know, or whatever, whatever a Jewish name would be. Go to his house and prepare. He didn't do that because Judas was likely present and would know the location. Je- again, Jesus is in control of this whole thing. So you're not going to get one over on Jesus. Come on. It's not going to happen. Scriptures say that he knows our thoughts from afar. <laughs> so we can't even know. He knows our thoughts before we think them. That's the slight advantage, I would say. So he's not going to get one over on him. So again, Judas was not a victim. He had a complicit heart. He had fertile ground for Satan to enter and, and for him to, and Satan's probably doing it to make sure that it happens, to you know, not trusting that Judas could actually pull it off. And then he says, what you do, do quickly. Now, this is often overlooked. Why didn't he say, what you do, I mean, just go do what you're going to do. Because he added the quickly because there was a timing to everything. Judas apparently was not on Jesus' timeline. Maybe he was slow dragging this whole act, you know, or thinking like, well, I can't even know where he's ever going to be because it seems like he, you know, ends up in places I can't, I don't expect, I can't know ahead of time. Or, you know, he's like, I don't know what he's going through his mind, but he's probably not on the same time frame. So G- Jesus adds what you do, do it quickly. So I think that's I think that's really important. I lose my pages here. I don't know what I did here. I'm lost. There we go. I think we're we're getting there. All right. The second point I want to bring up is nobody ultimately knows anyone else's heart. And we see that in verses 28 to 30. Look at me at verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some said it to Judas. Not what he said to John, but what he said to Judas. No one knew. For Verse 29, for some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. And it was night metaphorically or symbolically as well, not just physically, because now from this point on, once I mean, Jesus is going to still spend much time with them, many hours with him, but it's causing this, of this cause and effect thing to eventually culminate in the darkness of Judas actually betraying a friend. Because Jesus said that. He said, you do betray the Son of Man. Or friend, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss, which was something that that Judas didn't have to do. He could just point it, point his finger and say, that's him right there. But he went up and did it with a kiss, like so much betrayal um, wrapped up in one act. It's unbelievable. But the disciples had no idea what Jesus, why Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. Not one of them, not, not any of the 11, not even John, didn't understand, didn't understand these things. Again, you would think they would know by now, at least John, but they, they just didn't get it, didn't grasp it. it. It just, they respected Judas so much. They couldn't imagine Judas as being a possibility. So they thought it's, you know, he has the money box. Jesus is sending him to buy something for the Passover or give some, something to the poor. They had no idea who Jesus, who Judas uh, really was. Now, now, Jesus at one point in his ministry taught about the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And that whole parable is communicating because this, this, these tares were sown by the enemy into this field and it ruined the crop. It would choke out the fruitfulness of the real wheat. And then he's talked about at the end, that's all harvested and separated out. And he said that what would happen at the end of the age when God separates out the real from the fake in terms of people that are around the things of God. So we can't ultimately know. That's the whole lesson. We can't know. We have to trust it to God and just know that it's happening. So we don't know. In this room, when you came in, who was carded having some kind of thing saying, I'm a Christian? No one here. We don't know who comes in. Anybody can enter in. So when we gather, we're, there's a lot of situations and people and backgrounds and spiritual um, realities that are going on. And, and the people that come in here, there's, there's likely people here that, that have come regularly here that don't understand the gospel, never had their, their lives changed, never gone from darkness to light. 
And that's sad. And that's why I try to give the gospel all the time. But I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus was doing so many miracles. John's going to tell us as we get towards the end of the book that if all the books, there's not a library that could hold all the books that could be written talking about all the, the signs that Jesus performed. And Judas was on the, had a front row seat to that. He saw it all. That's why we can't assume that people would believe. And they'll tell you, some you know, non-believers will tell you sometime, you put Jesus right before me and let him perform a miracle, I'll believe. No. They didn't back then. I always bring that up. They didn't back then in Jesus' ministry. They didn't all believe. So that just shows you how dark our hearts are. Number one, the, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? But also the fact that it's a supernatural thing that happens. It's a supernatural thing. And we can't talk anybody into the kingdom. So we can't know ultimately anybody's heart. But we can have a little heads up and inclination, at least maybe not to know for sure whether or not they're believers that we come in contact with, but for prayer, I believe, to pray for them that they, if they're not a believer, that they would come uh, to, to the Lord and, and become a believer. So there's just two scriptures I want to read that, that clearly says, and it's by John himself in his epistle, that clearly says if these things aren't in place. There's, it's problematic at best. And, and but obviously, again, we can't know f- for sure. But we do need to be aware of these scriptures. I want to read to you from 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. It says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he, does not, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God? whom he hasn't seen. So that that the lack of love, the love is the primary fruit of the Spirit that comes out of people's lives when they're believers. Love comes, it's listed first. I don't know if that's because it's in the, in the list of the fruits of the Spirit, if that's because it's the predominant thing. I believe that, but we don't know that for sure. But love is going to come out of someone's life if they, if they know the Lord. And if you see him over a long period of time and you never see love and all you see is hate, that can tell you that it's it's possible, likely, that they don't know the Lord. The other thing is obedience to Jesus and walking as Jesus walked. I want to read again to you uh, from 1 John, and this time in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Now by this we know we know him if we obey his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. If you ever question your salvation, ask that question. Do I do I walk as Jesus did? Does obedience, generally speaking, none of us are perfect. We all sin every day. The standard is perfection. We still don't meet up to it. But generally speaking, does obedience mark my life? Does love and obedience to Jesus, generally speaking, mark my life? That's that's a general indication. Again, none of us can ultimately know. Only God knows the heart. So that's that's the that's the crux of how we can get a sense potentially, and we shouldn't even be spending much time and effort on this at all. It, he, but John wrote it. John wrote it for believers, and there's a reason why he wrote this to believers. And the Holy Spirit can apply those verses in many different ways in our lives. But I just want you to know that not everybody that says Lord, Lord, he, Jesus said, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And they'll claim miracles. And we prophesy in your name. And we cast out demons in your name. And he says, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. So he never had a personal relationship with those people. And they're going to say, we did all these stuff. Which means that those things aren't necessarily signs. The supernatural isn't necessarily a sign that you're legitimate. The magicians in Egypt could copy a lot of what Moses did to a point. But So that doesn't mean that that is a guarantee that the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and the miracles and all that for sure doesn't give you a solid ground to stand on in terms of assessing someone else or yourself. But what does, not the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit coming out of my life. See, fruit is for something in a tree that has bearing fruit. The fruit is not supremely for the tree. It's supremely for people to come up, partake, and enjoy. Sometimes we can even make the fruit of the Spirit selfish. (laughs) And and we are self-consumed with the fruit of the Spirit, thinking that God is producing this out of my life, so I would be the primary person enjoying it. It's not. It's for others to enjoy. First of all, it's for God to enjoy. Then second, it's for other people's outside of myself to enjoy. Just like a tree has apples or whatever 
whatever's growing for someone else to enjoy, not the, 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 the tree. As I close, I have three applications. First of, all, first of all, you can be around Jesus in the flesh for years and not believe. There's no amount of evidence, if that's true, there's no amount of evidence we can give people if they're not ready. If I just showed them this DVD, if, I just, if they just could see the chosen, if they could just see the, Je- the, Jesus, the passion of the Christ, if they could just read this book, if they could, we just think if there's just one thing, they can open up a fortune cookie and receive Christ. <laughs> I mean, God could do it so many different ways. When I got saved, I didn't have anyone preach the gospel to me. I didn't go up after the service. I got saved right in the pew. The pastor was annoying me so much by screaming. He was screaming. And I don't mean just slightly screaming. He was yelling. And then they're looking around like, this is normal? They've actually put up with this every week? I didn't listen to any. He was so distracting by his method of communication. But we all joined hands at this one point to pray for somebody. And this girl that I was pursuing, not Sandy, another girl, I was holding her hand. I was fine. I didn't like holding this guy's hand. But I, I, but all of a sudden, it was like this, God just showed me you are a sinner. You are, you're going to go to hell. You're not on your way to heaven. Your life's a mess. You need to surrender to me. Like only the Holy Spirit can. Just a ultimate supernatural checkmate in my heart. He convicts the world of sin. Jesus said that. We're going to see that in John as we go through these chapters. He convicts the world of sin. And I just said, Lord, I surrender. I give you my life right now, 100%. There was no altar call. There was no gospel. And boom, he saved me and baptized me with the Holy Spirit. I received the gift of tongues. I didn't even know what that was. I thought these people would think I'm crazy. I don't even know if they believe that this, whatever is happening is, is from God. I know it's from God. I didn't know that. They, they, they totally believed in that. I had no idea. And I you know, walked with him ever since, 33 years. So we have to realize we can't talk people into the kingdom. And they could be around the things of the Lord all the time. We could get so frustrated. Why don't they receive? Why don't they? Because there's a timing, just like there was a timing with you. Right after I pray with someone to receive Christ and their eyes are open, they immediately getting frustrated that no one believes them, that they care about her and their family, that they also just immediately just like surrender and, you know, what, what do I need to do? Like, do I need to raise my hand and you say, I see the hand or, you know, like, like, what do I need to do? Like they they think they're going to have this positive response. And sometimes they do. Most of the time they don't. And I try to encourage them. That didn't happen for you. Yeah, that's right. There's a timing. God's working with people's situations and their lives. The second application is you can be around someone for years and not know of their unbelief. Everything on the outside looks great, if, but if they reveal themselves as unbelievers, what God wants you to know is you still need to trust God with their souls because they can be very religious. The flesh loves to be religious. The flesh loves ritual. We will go through the motions. I'm always trying to fight get going through the motions here with us, like try to have some life breathe, breathed into the situation, not get stuck in doing it the same way all the time. Jesus didn't work the same way all the time. He worked differently. So they wouldn't put him in this box and say, when he, when he, heals, when he heals, it has to look this way. He, he worked differently in every situation. He'll work differently in us uh, and through us. So when, when that's revealed, when we realize a person really doesn't believe, they don't remain with us, as John will say. They were of us, but they weren't with us. Or they were with us, but they weren't of us. And the proof of that is that they're not with us now. That happens in our lives. We have people that we think are believers and we can't be stumbled and think that God let us down by that because there's a timing for all that. So we just need to lift them up, keep them them in prayer and preach the gospel to them. They now are a candidate for the gospel being preached to them because they're not believers. Lastly, and I'll close with, really close with this. Have an accurate view of yourself and and what you're capable in the right circumstance or the wrong uh, circumstances. Be humble and, and, and don't think you stand apart from God's help, but take heed lest you fall. It's when we put our guard down, when we stop. There are people that I know right now in this church that are allowing things, and you're not, they're not in this room, uh, but they're allowing things to get in the way. Don't worry, I'm not talking to you. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing a picture of a worship leader. No, I'm just I see that hand. Thank you. 
Uh, no, but they're not here. But they're allowing things that are actually normal things. And as far as the world's concerned and the schedules and what would, they're allowing those things to get in the way of them being consistent among God's people and fellowshipping. And they have no idea how they're, they're being set up for a fall because they think they can handle it. Oh, I can handle it. Oh, I got this. I got this. I, I, you know, look, I've, I haven't, I've gone this long without being consistent, without being obedient to being among God's people or whatever it is in their life that they're blowing off. I've made it this far and I'm fine. But that's not what happens. What happens is when you least expect it, it doesn't happen necessarily right away. Then Satan arranges this perfect situation. You're totally set up and then you're not spiritually strong and you fall. And it all goes back to obeying the Lord in the first place and being consistent. You know, it says that servants of the Lord must not strive. And if one is a servant, he must be counted faithful. Faithfulness is important. We can blow things off and we can, you know, not, not take it seriously. God wants us to be faithful. I told you when I was a new Christian, they told me, be fat. And I took that to heart, unfortunately. No, the other fat. Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithfulness is not seen in our culture. Let people are less and less dependable, less and less faithful. We should be faithful as Christians. The most faithful people in this world should be Christians. They should do that. Well, I don't know. I don't know what they believe, and I don't totally understand it, but I know I can count on them. I know that they're consistent. I know that I that they're dependable. That's how all of us should be. And, and especially in the household of faith here, to be faithful, to be consistent. Don't just let just the slightest thing get in the way of being among God's people in worship. Don't be that fragile. Be per person, you know, people will take things, so especially their job. You know, like, uh, you know, Hades or high water, they're going to be faithful at their job and consistent and all of that. But when it comes to eternal things that are going to affect you for eternity, that's up to debate. I can let the smallest thing get in the way of that. I can have something just happen and all of a sudden now I'm, 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 I'm not going to be at the thing. I'm not going to be at the Bible study. I'm not going to be at whatever it is. I'm not going to be there for a friend like when they need me to be because I'm just not going to be faithful. God's called us to be faithful and humble. And if we think that we stand apart from him and in our own resources, we're going to fall. It's just a matter of time. You know, I'll, close, I'll really close my third close. I get five. No, I'm just kidding. If you're visiting here, don't think that. Uh, but, but Jesus talked about this whole parable of this man who built his house on sand and he built his house upon a rock. And when he built his house upon the rock with a solid foundation, it says when the storm came, not if, but when the storm came, that house stood and, and stood up against that storm. But the other man that built his house on the sand, that house fell and great was its fall. Great was its fall. How do we handle storms of life in the future? is by obedience and faithfulness now. And we're, the people that I've seen over 30, over 30 years of walking with the Lord, the people that I've seen that stand when crises hit them are the ones that have a pattern and, of obedience long before that. So when the th storm came, their house stood. But the ones who didn't do that and their lives weren't marked with obedience and seriousness and faithfulness, their house collapsed. Their faith collapsed because they didn't build into their life the, the strength of future or the, the, uh, the, the blessing of future fortitude in how the Lord builds into us strength when we previously uh, were obeying him. And then that doesn't happen. Jesus said, who, who hears my words and obeys me, I compare to the man who builds his house upon a rock. Not just hears the word. So we wonder when we say, don't be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. You want to deceive yourselves. What is that mainly about? It's about obedience. When we hear Jesus's word, we have to think, not, do I like this sermon? Do I, do I agree with this sermon? We'd be listening for, do I obey what's in this sermon? What's in the word? Do I obey that? Am I currently obeying it? Not, am I generally obeying it? But on this day, December 10th, am I, am I obeying this currently? And it's even worse when we listen to sermons for other people. Have you heard that? About doing that? Have you thought about that? You listen to sermons, oh, they need to hear this. Someone so needs to be here. You're just getting that word just swiped. I mean, it's like snatched out right there because you're not listening for you. That's why James talks about the word being like a mirror. And it's a brilliant analogy because mirrors give you a present snapshot of your current condition. It's not always enjoyable to see that present snapshot. 
But he says, don't forget what you look like. Walk away and forget what you look like. James says that. So we have to look in the mirror of God's word every single day and let God speak to us and say, am I obeying this? If I'm not, I need to repent right now. The distance between we hear God's word that's convicting and we repenting, that, that distance as we grow in the Lord should be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you sin, boom, convicted, repent, confess, rep- boom, right then. Not waiting, not letting it build up, not waiting for that, that, that conviction feeling, you know, like emotion, but it's spiritual. He's convicting me in my spirit, and I'd say, you know what, God, you're right, I repent. Quick to repent. That's a sign of a mature believer. So much in God's word here. I just love it so much. Let's, let's ask the Lord to, to bless the rest of our meeting today. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for how it has spoken to us. And Lord, thank you that, that um, you want us to change. You want us to surrender to you. And to you love convicting us because you know that, that that's a privilege to repent. And that by repenting, you'll change us and we'll grow into maturity. So we pray that you'd use these verses for your purposes. Thank you that we get to learn all together as a family. We also thank you for our family lunch and the food. And we just pray, Lord, that you would use this time that we have together for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.